Hey, fans of Muscle Cars with Eric, I want to introduce you to the street racing legend itself, the Black Ghost, straight from Detroit, Michigan, right to your screen. You have got to be kidding me. This car is a legend. This car is the only car I have ever seen to be actually part of the National Historic Registry. The car is registered in the Smithsonian Institute, and the car is a legend among legends. Yes, the car was owned by a city of Detroit police officer. The car would show up at races, beat everybody. I'm sure it lost a race here or there. But then would disappear for three or four months, only to show up again. And then the car was never driven since 1976. I interviewed, actually, John Craman, the voice of Meekum Auction. We had a nice long interview and chit-chat about the Black Ghost car, which is going up for auction here in uh, this coming May in Indianapolis, Indiana. Check out the video. We have an interview with Greg Qualls, the owner, coming up here soon. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for watching. It's a 1970 Dodge Challenger Hemi RT SE four speed track pack 410 gears was ordered specifically for one thing go fast in a straight line and it was ordered by the most unlikely military veteran a paratrooper even more astonishing is the fact that for over 35 years he was a Detroit police officer now I've said that why does that make such a difference with this car I can only imagine GQ was street racing this car on the streets of Detroit back in the 1970s while he was a police officer, hence the name Black Ghost. So here's how the story unfolds. So he went out, drive his car at night. He race you, line up with you, race you. He beats you, and then he just disappear. And he says, don't give away my fucking car. Uh, one year, we were driving up and down. I ended up taking to the show, and boy, was he right, because the, the time I pulled the car off the trailer and was driving it to the location where to park the car, people would come around and come see the car. People were telling me about my dad's racing, and I had no idea that my dad was racing. And they were just mystified as I was, because I found out that my dad was racing the car and he didn't tell me. The guy was like, yeah, your dad used to come into the shop and talk about the car, but we never seen it. And so then two years won't go by. And then in 2020, that's when the Historical Vehicle Association calls me back and he says, hey, you know, you remember us? We were at the Chrysler Carlisle uh, Nationals. And I said, yeah, sure. And it says, well, yeah, we'd like to induct your car into the Library of Congress. And I was like, what? It's registered with the uh, Library of Congress for 500 years. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Eric, Muscle Cars with Eric, and I have standing next to me here the voice of Meekum Auctions, John Craven. And John, we're in Glendale right now, right? Right, Glendale, Arizona for Meekum's fastest growing auction, by the way, now in our fifth year. I tell you what, I noticed you had guys expand in a couple days, so that's really, really cool. And I'm very, very pleased and honored to be here with the guy that's been doing this for a number of years. But what's even more cool is we were standing in front of the legendary 1970 Dodge Hemi Challenge the Black Ghost. So John, it's a, again, it's a pleasure to be being here today and having you be part of this. It's an honor. Tell us all about this cool car, man. I mean, it's a legend. Well, first of all, man, we appreciate you having the interest. You know, it's kind of our responsibility, as we were talking about, to continue to push forward the legacy and the lore and the facts of important cars from the past. Now, we all know Hemi. In the muscle car world, that is the number 
number one buzzword for performance. Even today's top fuel cars and funny cars are based on the venerable old Chrysler and Mopar Hemis. Anyway, if we take it to a peak, if we take and we distill the roughly 10,000 or so uh, second generation Hemi cars are built between 66 and 71, there are a couple cars that stand out at the top of the heap. And the Black Ghost, the 1970 Dodge Challenger Hemi RT SE four-speed track pack 410 gears was ordered specifically for one thing go fast in a straight line and it was ordered by the most unlikely enthusiast that you'd ever imagine his name was Godfrey Qualls GQ as he was known as well that's a pretty cool you know nomenclature for him GQ it is very cool it is he was a military veteran he was a paratrooper he got a purple heart he rejoined the Army Reserves and and became a Green Beret. But even more astonishing than that, an American hero, is the fact that for over 35 years he was a Detroit police officer. Now, I've said that. Why does that make such a difference with this car? I can only imagine. GQ was street racing this car on the streets of Detroit back in the 1970s while he was a police officer, hence the name Black Go. So here Here's how the story unfolds. He was a thrill seeker, no doubt about that. So he would go out and he would search for targets in his well prepared and well set up Hemi Challenger and look for folks to race. And he would do a race or two and then he would disappear into the darkness. He would take the car home, put it away in the garage and not even take it out and do any more street racing, maybe for a couple, two, three months at a time. Over time it developed this reputation of being, was it real, was it not, was it urban legend? Like, who is this guy, And right? All yeah. the above. It and it was so cool. And it was man. wild because it was kept secret for so many years. He passed, unfortunately, in 2015. And that's when the notoriety and the facts of the car could finally be shared with all of us car enthusiasts, guys like you and me. So here's what happened. It was passed down to his son, Gregory, who said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share this story and this car with the world. Here's what's happened. He got the car out of mothballs in his dad's garage. He did just some sympathetic mechanical upgrades um, such as, you know, getting, you know, flushing a cooling system, um, rebuilding the distributor, of course, all fluid changes. Got the car operational after being in storage for so long. Then it's time to take it on the road and tell the story. It has been featured on videos, television shows, magazine articles, tons of information on the web. Just Google Black Ghost and a whole bunch of stuff will pop up. He just felt it was important to share this story with the rest of the automotive world. As a result of that, the powers to be that run the National Historic Register of the most significant American cars or cars that were used in America, it got entered into the Historic Registry and it actually was on display in Washington, D.C. at the mall in a glass case as an important part of American motoring history. That is so cool. So, you know, we talk a lot in the country world about Holy Grail, the most significant, but honestly, if you take the hardware, if you take the build strategy of how he put this car together with the colors and all the high performance options and then luxury options, Eric, on top of that, the gator grain top. Now, he ordered a vinyl top. And it came with a really cool gator grain. He didn't want that. He wanted just a regular regular vinyl top, but that's the way it came. But power windows, MFM stereo radio, along with the with the track pack that's with the 410 right gears. FM started, wasn't it? Oh yeah, that was like a that was like a three hundred dollar option back then for the MFM radio. It was very expensive. Anyway, so his intention was to use the car for a variety of purposes, but really the main priority was for this car to go fast in a straight line. And it was mission accomplished. The car um, was in the sole possession of Godfrey Qualls. We'll refer to him as GQ. GQ. Yeah. What a cool name. Isn't huh? that right? Yeah, it doesn't get any better <laughs> than that. Um, who was a, obviously an automobile enthusiast, big time motorcycle fan as well. And ultimately, the notoriety of the car, Eric, it was a notoriety of the car. Uh, and the fact that it was in long-term storage in his private garage for really since the mid-70s up until about 2015. 
and the car was honored uh, by the government to be part of the National Historic Registry. I think there's only around 35 cars over the years that have been entered into that. So that is a difficult, I mean, so many people want to get their cars of into course, there, yeah. and they actually seek the car and the story out, and boom, it's isn't in. It, isn't it interesting how a military veteran, Vietnam War veteran, he's a hero, he's a Purple Heart awardee, buys a car just to street race it, and then 40 years later or so, it turns out to be part of the National Registry just because of the way he raced it. Yeah, and and How and, cool. and the fact that the car, the fact that the car remains a time capsule. It was been in his care and now his family's care for all of that entire period of time. That's what really makes it so special. It hasn't bounced around between, um, you know, opportunists that want to sort of like tag onto the story for profit. It has nothing to do with it. This was a, this was a car that was his his life, an American hero's life, a great guy, retired uh, from the police department in Detroit. 30 some years. Yeah, over it? 30, yeah, over 35 years as, wow. as, a, as a police officer, raised a wonderful family. I mean, just really one of the coolest guys ever. And now we fast forward to today, you know, it's, it's, it's bittersweet because, you know, GQ's not here to enjoy his car anymore. But on the other hand, those of us that heard about this car, the urban legend, the lore of the Black Ghost, not sure if it really existed or not. Right. Now we know that it does. We yeah. know the stories are real. We know the car is real. The car exists. We can see it, we can touch it, and for a lucky potential buyer, there's gonna be an opportunity to own and acquire this car. Now, we know that the value of a Hemi Challenger, especially one that's equipped in an almost unbelievably fashion with the performance options and the luxury options that this car has. It's in original condition. The car is not, you know, there's patina on the car. Sure. I like that because that indicates an honesty. This car has had good care, but not obsessive care right. over the years. It was driven, and it was driven on the streets of Detroit. You're a Detroit boy, yep, and yep. You, know how, you know how hardcore and how gritty that city and how serious the car enthusiasts oh, are absolutely. there. And I got to put GQ up at the top of the list, because not only did he talk the talk, he walked the walk. Yeah, he did it illegally. He was out street racing a car while he was a police officer trying to That's avoid creative, any notoriety. Though, right? That's very creative to think about it. He must have known when they were chasing down the street racers to kind of disappear, unless he just did that on his own free will and volition. So I'm going to bust ass, bust butt, whatever it is, and I'm going <laughs> to win and then disappear. Did you think he had a plan for that, or was it because he knew the cops were? Shaking, you know, shaking down the street right here. You know, it's really, it's really hard to kind of look into his mind. I think the first and foremost thing, Eric, is he was a, he was a thrill seeker. He had over 300 jumps as a paratrooper. Over 300. He loved high performance motorcycles. In fact, Black Coast has a trailer hitch on the back I of it, and that. it's still on there. And you know why it's on there? To pull his motorcycle trailer. Dog he, was a big Norton, he was a big Norton Commando oh, okay. fan, which, oh, okay. I mean, who isn't? I'm a motor, right. motorcycle right. guy, too. Right. And, uh, so, and he, he had other motorcycles as well, but that is still on the car. So, so, so what this car is, is you get, there's, there, there are so many elements to the fabric of this car. Right. The fact that he special ordered it, number one, and he carefully chose the colors and the options. It's one of one, period. Number two, he street raced the car while he was a police officer, of course, illegal as you could possibly get, and avoided detection for at least five or six years. Right. He was never caught, he was never reprimanded. It's unbelievable, the story continued to churn. The car is in original condition, it has not been repainted, it has not been restored, and today, it's really an important part of muscle car history. You know, Eric, I think one of the most surprising facts of this whole thing. It's not the fact that this is such a special car, such a special build. It's stood the test of time. It's, it's, it's really a testament to what was going on in the mid-1970s. The performance car era was winding down. Right. It was being celebrated really one sort of last time before we entered the what's referred to as the malaise era of heavier cars, big bumpers because of all kinds of new rulings. Of course, lower compression engines. Fuel economy was becoming an issue. Insurance was a big problem. Um, but even more so than that is the fact that this car, all these years, it stayed under the radar. He was never caught. He was able to avoid getting in trouble. Now, 
I don't think any of us want to endorse street racing, but you know, back in the 1970s, things were different. It was an accepted way of guys with fast cars would go out and play around. And when we say racing, we're not talking about professionally set up you know, racing events on the street. Right. We're talking about just driving around, looking for another performance car, matching up with this, and playing a little bit of Stoplight Grand Prix. Again, not endorsing it, but Stoplight. it did happen a lot. And this car in the streets of Detroit, this is the car that eluded direct attention and became this this legend over all these years. So really, you know, it's 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 all of these factors that 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 mesh into this to make this car so special, to make it as worthy as it is of the notoriety of it. The fact that you and me are sitting here talking about it right now, we're kind of preserving the story for history in addition to telling the story today to a potential buyer. Uh, there are a lot of folks that collect, a lot of high-end collectors that collect cars, performance cars, muscle cars. Right. This is about, honestly, this is about as good as it gets. I cannot think of another single individual muscle car from you know the mid 60s to the early 1970s, muscle car era 1.0 or the golden era, whatever you want to call it, that is probably as significant as this one car. Sounds like a sales pitch, it's not. So everybody, it's is Eric with Muscle Cars with Eric, and I have a crazy cool opportunity here to uh, meet with and talk with Gregory Qualls, who is the current owner of the legendary Black Ghost. And uh, Gregory, thank you so much for being part of this um, YouTube uh, video of your father's legendary street racing machine. I appreciate it. It's very nice meeting you. Yeah, it's nice meeting you too as well. Yeah, thank you. So um, we're going to reach back here a little bit. I actually had not heard of Black Ghost until the recent Meekum auction um, that I learned of it. And uh, I think you know a guy named John Jenza, also known as Top Hat John? Yes. Yeah, he is a, a good friend of mine. And we were at the Meekum auction together, and he told me that I absolutely positively have to get this car because it's considered the holy grail of Mopar. So if you can, give me a little background information about you. I know your father um, owned the car for a while. Talk to me a little bit about, I guess, uh, the beginnings of, if you know the beginnings of when he had this car. And and I have some history, but I want to hear it from you, actually, regarding what's going on with the car. Okay, yeah. So my, uh, so my dad was in the military uh, from 64 to 66. He was in the 82nd Airborne is a paratrooper and um uh, he got drafted in there and went to the dominican republic and got a purple heart and he got out and he did some odd end jobs and then he wanted to uh buy a nice car so he ended up ordering a uh dodge challenger uh for reno brothers in detroit michigan um in october of 69 and uh, he received the car in december december 5th of 69 and he had a brand new uh, black Hemi Challenger RTSE 426 Hemi with a 410 wow. rear <laughs> rear axle, the uh, Super Track Packs they call it. Yeah, with eight grain roof. Um, so, and that's what he ended up getting. Yeah, that's an unusual roof, Gregory. It's alligator grain. I've never seen it before. Tell me yeah. a little bit about that. Did you, I guess your dad didn't really want it or something? Is that is that true? Yeah, that that is true. Um, a, when he originally ordered the car, it was supposed to come with a shaker hood. So it's supposed to come with the shaker hood and it's supposed to have the black, just a black bore skin uh, vinyl top. Right. That's all it was supposed to have. So when he received the car, it didn't come with the shaker and it came with the, the gator grain. And that's okay. what makes the car unique is the yeah. gator grain uh, with yeah. the combinations of the car. Yep, that's pretty cool. So I'm surprised that he took delivery of it, although that's a very, very nice car. I understand all the check marks were on the uh on the build sheet everything was was listed that he wanted right yeah yeah, yeah that's pretty cool all right yeah yeah so he I, yeah he special ordered a car you know he handpicked yeah. what he wanted and uh he wanted the best and that's what he wanted well that's very cool it, it's well deserved you know i mean a purple heart awardee in the military 82nd airborne and he uh must have served in vietnam because 82nd airborne went to vietnam is that correct 
Uh, yes. Okay. Well, he. Okay. I, I think he went. Well, as far as Vietnam, I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay. That, I don't, all I know, he's he references the uh, Dominican Republic in 64 to 66. Oh, so I see. Very, okay. So the very beginning of the Vietnam War. Um, right. So I know they had a special operation there in the Dominican Republic. Okay. Um, but I'm not sure. I don't know everything about that, so I'm not 100 percent right. sure. That's one of those top secret things that we don't have the right to know about. You know what I mean? Yeah. Jungle warfare. I mean, who knows? I mean, you know, I'm sure the jungles in uh, uh, where your father was, as opposed to jungles uh, the other side of the world, are pretty much similar. So, you know, maybe jungle warfare training. Who knows what? You know? Yeah. Well, he, he, anyhow, he talked about, a bit, about being in combat and getting shot at and stuff by airplanes and all kinds of things over there. So that's never good. No. So yeah. in December. No. Never good. no. <laughs> December 1969, he takes delivery of this bad devil. Now, uh, let's kind of move forward with this a little bit. Did he immediately start taking on on a strip, or on, I mean, on the streets, you know, and just trashing everybody else? Yeah. So what he ended up doing, he wanted he after he bought the car, he wanted to to really enjoy the car, and then uh, he applied for a different job. Um, so he went out and drive his car at night. He race you, line up with you, race you. Um, he beats you and then he just disappear into the night. So he wouldn't come back. He just disappear. And wow. the reason why he did that is because uh -huh. of his new job, because okay. he was hired uh, with the Detroit the police department. Well, then street racing is kind of like not a thing you're supposed to do as a cop, right? No. Let alone as, as a no. civilian <laughs> work. That's funny. Wow. So now, you know, if these are grudge races, like he would collect cash from these, from these people, probably so I'm guessing, or. Any idea? You know, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, from 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 what I understand, from what what the uh, the friends of the um, friends of my dad tell me, and then just people, just he just raced just to race. Okay, it wasn't anything far as as far as I understand, as far as pink slips or anything like that or money. Right. Okay, but um, okay. because you know he couldn't, I guess he couldn't let people really know who he was, so he couldn't collect any of that stuff. Very very true. So he stayed. He showed up at these races and stayed in his car. And whomped on people basically, and then yeah. said, "Off in right. the distance he goes, right?" And just wow, gone. That, that is so cool. Ghost you. Yeah, he go. <laughs> well, that's how he got the name, the Black yeah. Ghost, because people wow. remember the black car with the um, Pan Africa stickers on the side fender of the yeah. car. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool stuff. I mean, that is a very, very distinct looking. It's a really cool look too. I had a chance to check it out and. Uh, so he raced, and then I guess in 1976 was the last time the car was actually registered in, in Michigan? Yeah, so it was in 70, 76, 77 is when the okay. car was last registered. Yeah, I, from what I remember as a kid, because I actually had a chance to uh, ride in a car, so around 79 and 80 is when the car was this last ride um, that I was in the car, and um, he put a $100 bill in a dash, and he says, if you can get this $100 bill, it's it's yours. I was thinking, oh, this is gonna be easy. So at the time, I was about maybe eight years old. Then okay, so thinking, uh, you know, this is an easy thing. I just grab the hundred dollars. Hundred bucks for an eight year old is great too, isn't it? Man? Yeah. <laughs> so he said go, and he and I went to go reach for the bill, and I, he took off, and I was like, well, right in the back of the back of the seat, and I fell to the slump to the side, and my dad had to catch me. And I, all I remember, it just scared me, scared the heck out of me. Oh wow! The power of the car just taking off and. And uh, yeah, I never did get that hundred dollar bill. Wow! <laughs> but you have a really cool story, Gregor. That's awesome, man. Right on. So now, after that, did 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 the car get up an operational? Was that you said that was the last ride, right? Yeah, that was the last ride. He put it back in the garage, and from what I remember, he put it on jack stands, and that was it. And wow. it just sat, just sat in the garage for over thirty plus years. Was there any particular reason, or you just didn't want to street race anymore, or was his, I, his interest went yeah. elsewhere? Well, during family that time, stuff. I think it was just the family because okay. we, we were having kids, and so I had other brothers and sisters, and also too as well. He went back into the military in seventy was it seventy eight, seventy seven, seventy seven, seventy eight. When he went okay. back into the military, um, went back to training, um, got his uh, apl applied for Green Beret training, got his Green Beret. Oh wow! Special, and uh, went into Special Forces, and he served out of the twelfth group and the nineteenth group as a national guard reservist along along uh with being a detroit police officer that's really cool that damn man your dad i gotta say your dad's badass that's pretty cool stuff yeah wow so, 
So he served as not only did he serve his country, but his, he served his community as well. So yeah, I understand. He also um, part of his duties as a Detroit police officer um, was a uh, uh, motorcycle cop. Is that right? Yes, he was. Uh, okay. Yep, um, a motor uh, uh, traffic enforcement uh, police officer, and uh, he did a lot of that on his motorcycle. And okay. Yeah. Now. Um, I also understand somebody mentioned to me, uh, I think it was uh, John um, Cameron of uh, of uh, Meekum, the city okay. dad was also a motorcycle collector. Is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So he had a bunch of different bikes. Yes, he did. Well, sort of like a collector. Um, okay. I think he just bought the bikes because he, he liked riding bikes in okay. general. Uh, he had a lot of bikes. He sold and bought bikes. Uh, he had BSAs, Triumphs. He had a uh, 68 Norton Fastback. He had a wow. 67 Norton uh, NC Matchless. So he had some really nice rare uh, European bikes. Wow. Uh, he was in the BMWs, Harley Davidsons. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but he never really owned a Harley Davidson. The, the Harley Davidson bike was the police bike that he brought. Okay. Home. But uh, but the BMWs, the, the Triumphs, the um, the uh, BSAs, and the, the Nortons are, were the bikes that he bought. That's pretty cool stuff. Now, that is going to segue us very nicely into the trailer hitch on the back of the car. Yes. You never see yes. a street racing with a trailer hitch. So that's yes. cool. Now, I it, what was the trailer hitch for? Well, so, yeah, just as much as he loved cars, he was in the bikes. So that's, that's what cool. He, that's what he trailered with his motorcycles. Really? Yes. So he would put the put the bike on a trailer on the, on the back of the car, and he would just kind of go off into the countryside or something? Would he go to meets? Would he go to motorcycle shows i mean you, you know feel that's the a little bit there yeah that's the part i really don't know because i don't okay. really remember but uh i'm thinking it would have been meets or either racing racing his bikes um oh, wow. because he, he he would i remember as a kid that he would ride his bike i seen him myself personally where he'll he'll be riding his bike and he'll stop at a red light and his feet both either feet would ever touch the ground wow so he was just that serious the bike and then just take off we yeah, have on the light and i also see them do pop, cool. pop willies like go all, all the way down the block with doing a willy like eh. so he'd done some really really cool things but you know as a kid i didn't know how special that was until sure you get in the, as an adult and you realize that yeah those are really difficult things to do yes they are yeah yeah wow that's pretty cool sounds like your dad was kind of like a uh adrenaline junkie i mean you know being a paratrooper somebody said he had over 300 jumps is that right yes yes wow yeah, yeah. can you imagine now i gotta ask you this straight up can you imagine jumping out of a perfectly good airplane just because no <laughs> i can't <laughs> but you know what my, my dad said you know he said you know he loved jumping and jumping was an addiction to him he he said that you know and and that's what he loved to do so so we're okay. gonna fast forward a little bit and uh, I understand your your dad was your your family is all grown and gone, and uh, grandkids probably and whatnot. But your dad reached out to you. Um, give me a little bit of background about that. I don't want to. Um, yeah, just tell me what what happened there. How you ended up in the car? Oh, okay. So yeah, so um, I guess I kind of always kind of knew I was gonna get the car at some point in time. You know, if something ever happened to my dad, because he always talked about it as we were uh, growing up. Um, uh, so one day um, at this at this point in time, around um, 20, 2015, um, when he was sick in the hospital. Okay. So it was December twenty first because I remember the dates. It was December twenty first. My I was visiting my dad at the hospital, and you know, it, it going through the cancer because he had originally he had prostate cancer in two thousand eight, and then it, it went into remission, and then it came back around uh, twenty. 2014 2015 and at this time you know he's always in pain it metastasized into into his bones oh no okay yeah i'm sorry at this point. so he was i understand that's was, very painful too so i'm so sorry yeah. for that so he would take radiation just to, to help with the pain mm -hmm. that he had and um and then that's all it did it just it just it never really did anything for him it just helped with the pain okay and so he was very you know very sad and you know angry and upset and you know all those mixed emotions right yeah yeah so i haven't seen my dad 
in a long time, like happy in a long time. And I, and I understood that. So when I went to the hospital the 21st, he asked, he said, hey, son, are you going to come back up to the hospital tomorrow? I said, yeah, dad, you know, come visit you. And so he said, OK, so I'm going to draw you a little map. And uh, I want you to go to the house and get this envelope for me. And I said, are you sure I need a map to, to find an envelope? You just can't tell me where it's at. He says, no, no, you're going to need, need this map. So, wow. I got, so he drew me a little map kind of explain where the envelope was and then the next morning i got up i went to the house and sure enough i needed that that map because the way he had it hidden it was that's uh, pretty it, cool it was, it was in a really good spot so i grabbed the envelope out and i found it and i didn't think anything of it so i i just kept it sealed and i just uh went on through my day uh after work i went back up to the hospital and when i walked into the his hospital room and i had the envelope in my hand he looked at me and he saw the envelope in my hand. That was the first time I seen him like actually smile in months. Oh wow. Yeah. So he actually perked up a little bit. And I was like, That's oh, okay. very cool. So I gave him the envelope and he said, he said, All right, boy, go over there and you know, go, you know, grab me that a pin across at the table. So I went to go grab the uh, the pin from the hospital table. And then he was laying in his bed and uh he was up and he had um when I turned back around, um he had the envelope open and he had a bunch of paperwork and i saw a little green title and i was like oh wow is that is that the title to the car and he basically signed it and he says don't give away my fucking car that's what he told me it was it was it was really that's kinda, cool yeah but it, at that point in time it was like uh, you know i kind of really didn't want the car that way because it was kind of a sad moment for me right because it was like it was on bad terms you know i was I was hoping to to receive the car on, on better terms and not not my dad being on his deathbed, you know. Right. And um, yeah, so I wasn't really really happy about it. But uh, but yeah, he he signed over the car to me, and then um, and then from there I was on a mission to get it running. Okay, so that wasn't Mission Impossible because I understand that it actually got running. What did you have to do to the car? To get it running i know you didn't restore the car because it's obviously no. in as this condition which is per it's beautiful like that so what did you have to do gregory so what we end up doing is uh, uh a lot of the rubber most of the rubber pieces were hard and, and like petrified like real stiff oh like sure heater, heater hoses radiator hoses the radiator that he had in there wasn't the actual uh, original radiator because at some point in time the the clutch fan broke off and went into the radiator okay um so i don't have the uh, the 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 original radiator or the uh the clutch but those i got replaced with the the correct 956 glen ray uh mopar radiator okay because i wanted to make sure i wanted to kind of put the car back to stop so sure. that everything would be as is as if he you know bought it right and, and then that way i make it easier for us to work on it because then i had the the owner's manual or the service manual right that when you know everything was to spec stock spec okay so he had some um a few racing things on it like his, the distributor uh was different we had to rebuild the distributor because he had the distributor advanced at a certain timing and it was welded oh at that at that spot so i guess that from one, one of the mechanics was explaining to me is that so that when you put your foot on the gas that the power will be right there instead of waiting for that um there's little weights that right. spin and mm -hmm. then when they spin up then it advances the timing but the the timing was already pre-advanced okay. already that's cool and so those little racing tricks they did he also didn't run any exhaust on the car so he ran off the the um manifolds the stock manifolds to the uh h pipe and then that was it and it was cut there so there was no resonators or mufflers on the car oh so wow the car, so the car was extremely loud when we got it also it. that's like, what caused it to be so fast it was also breathing really well too yeah wow yeah yeah but i bet it was really ran, loud that's cool then he ran uh different ignition wires uh he had these red thick real red thick ignition mm -hmm. wires yeah. and he had this different coil so he had this special coil it was called a judson magneto coil oh wow so some kind of electric coil i guess to produce more spark sure you know for the engine and there was a couple, a couple other little tricks because i found out from um uh, from my dad's friend that they would take they used to take uh the, the gas the let it gas and they would take um a couple mothballs and put them in uh, a five gallon thing of gas and it would be like an octane booster oh well 
So Seriously? yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, that's I never fun. heard of it either, but oh, um, that's pretty neat. But yeah, I guess they, that's what they used for octane booster um, back then, and yeah. uh, that's how he basically ran it. And on oh, uh, he also put slicks, uh, eleven inch slicks on the rear, and he he ran a a compound called D four Goodyear D four uh, racing tires. So it was 11 inch slick that he ran on the back and then they hit, it was on a Ford rim, I guess, because the Ford rims with my, the bolt pattern was the same as the Chrysler. Okay. All right. Yeah. So you that's what, what diameter, I remember. You know what the diameter of the wheel was? 14, um, 15, that inch, probably. Okay. Yeah. That I don't know. That I don't okay. know. Um, but uh, the, I know the stock wheels on the car, uh, the original rims are uh, 15s. Okay. I do know that All right. with the polyglass tires. Cause I, we just, put it back to stock but uh but yeah as far as the uh the splicks i'm not sure that's a good okay. question i should, should uh look into that yeah now do you still have the slicks uh no just, no because okay. the slicks right. the slicks are, were from his buddy oh his i see friend. Okay. yeah because okay. i can just ask he's actually still alive so i can actually ask him okay. what the, the wheel size was the slick um but yeah but that's how you ran it and, wow um, yeah so, so now you got it running and when you got it running, did you actually drive it to make sure everything was working well and whatnot, working fine? Yeah. So, yeah, I wanted to make sure I wanted to drive the car. That's the re- one of the reasons why I wanted to get, okay. to get That's the car cool. running. Cause yeah, right I, I, well, why did my dad keep this car? And, you know, what was special about the car? Mm-hmm. And, you know, what, you know, why did he like it so much? And he, he knew was, he knew the car was valuable because at, at one point in time, actually several points in time, he actually was going to sell the car, but he just never did because he, he, he at the one time he wanted a hundred thousand for it, and the the people only offer him eighty five thousand, and he didn't take it. So, okay. And uh, <clears throat> so yeah, so that that's so, you, so you you drove the car for a bit, and then I understand that uh, um, you were reached out to by a variety of very um, significant. Uh, societies and organizations yeah. to showcase the car. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. I mean, like, like I understand it's a national historic monument or a historic. Oh yeah, yeah, or something. From, yeah, from the uh, Historical Vehicle Association. So I'll I'll go into the the explanation a little bit how we got there. So okay. in tw- so so in 2016, after I got the car running, it t- took us about roughly about. I think eight months, nine months to get the car running because I okay. work on it over the weekends. Of course, so I had to work. And then I got the car running, and we so I used to take it up to the ice cream shop with my family, and take it up. Uh, we even did the what were dream cruise uh, one year. We were driving up and down up the cruise, and then it rained on us, and I had to hurry up and get back home. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, so I was like, oh, that's but, cool uh, though. You cruise so it on we, Woodward, man. Way to go! Yeah, so we did enjoy the car, and at at that point in time, people didn't know what it really was, and they just knew it was a Hemi car. But then, um, um. I met through uh, John, Top Hat John. Yeah. yeah. Um, I met Bob Ashton. And Bob Ashton, he's the one of the, um, he, he runs the uh, Muscle Car and Corvette Nationals, which okay. is a show in Chicago. So we went there. This is how I start my journey. So Bob said, hey, you know, I end up meeting Bob. And he says, Bob says, you know, why don't you bring it to the show? And I was like, no, at first I didn't want to because. You know the car was in rough shape and i says well those cars are all beautiful they're restored they're pristine and bob was like no 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 you got to bring the car to the show come on and bring it up trust me trust me okay okay so he convinced me so okay i end up taking to the show and boy was he right because the the time i pulled the car off the trailer and was driving it to the location where to park the car people would come around and come see the car and people were amazed and and that's how that was the start of it. So then people were telling me about my dad's racing and I had no idea that my dad was racing, racing. The That's car. so cool. <laughs> so I didn't even know he was racing. So all the street racing stuff I heard from Chicago and in Detroit. So when we did the muscle car Corvette nationals in 2017, you know, people were amazed. They was like, Oh, wow. I, I can't believe the car's out. And this is the car. This is the urban legend that everybody was talking about. And they were just mystified as I was, because I found out that my dad was racing the car and he didn't tell me. That's I was funny. like, how my dad not tell me he was racing the car? <laughs> but I understood that, you know, he wanted to protect me. And then being as a police officer, he didn't want me going out there street racing because I was already into RC car racing, like racing RC cars and stuff. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, so that's what I did. So then, 
so then after the Chicago show, I was like, you know what? We did so well in Chicago. I have to bring it home and do a show at home. So then that's when we did the Autorama in 2018, uh, a couple months oh, right after the McCacken the, show. The legendary Detroit Autorama. Yep. So we did the Autorama, and then that's when a bunch of people came. Hey, where's Godfrey? Where's your dad? Blah, 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 blah. And uh, and it informed people, like, yeah, my dad passed. And he was like, oh, wow. And then I ended up talking to uh, a gentleman from Mancini Racing, and he remembered my dad going up to the old shop in uh, on the – on, well, I believe it was a Davidson around the Davidson Conant Conant and Six Mile oh, Davidson area. Sure. Yeah, where they yeah, had a yeah. Mancini shop. Like, and my, like sort of Midtown, him. isn't it? Davidson Six Mile. Um, well, closer to Hamtramck, I would say. Like yeah. Detroit, Hamtramck oh, borderline. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. And yeah. um, so, um, the guy was like, "Yeah, your dad used to come into the shop and talk about the car, but we never seen it." Really? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So he's 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 always kind of talked about the car, but a lot of people haven't never seen it. So then we um uh, and so that's how the Detroit show went, and just a lot of people were confirming that my dad did race the car and that he did know a lot of the people in the racing community. But then you know some people were upset with him because he just ghosts people and he would never get involved with the community with the race community mm -hmm. and uh and you know and that's probably one some of the reasons why the people didn't really know about the story or know about the car because right. it was it kind of kept as a secret you know and then and you know i understand that he's my dad being a police officer and he has to protect his uh his job for his family sure yeah yeah so then from there and then while i was in autorama i end up meeting uh, another guy named ed bootsky and he is the guy who runs the Carlisle Chrysler Nationals. And oh, I got wow. invited to his show. And we ended up going to his show. And when I was there, the Historical Vehicle Association is already in Pennsylvania. They're, or one of their headquarters is there. They came and saw the car at the show. And then um, they loved the story. And I end up, uh, they ended up giving me the Nationals called the National Heritage Award. For wow. Carlisle in 2018, so it's a big glass um, uh, crystal vase. I mean, it very was a nice. very nice, very nice trophy. And, and and in the meantime, all these shows, I never did sign up for any trophies. I didn't want it. All I wanted to do was just tell my dad's story. That's very cool. And, but they were just giving me trophies. They said, "Here, wow. you gotta have these trophies." It's like, wow. okay, so I, okay. I just twist my arm. <laughs> yeah, I just took them. So then I continued to to take the show. I mean, take the car to local shows this time. So from twenty, so after the Carlisle show, I did a bunch of small local shows um, in Michigan and in the Detroit area, like the Gilmore uh, Museum, um, a lot of the local shows around the different areas. And so then two years went go by, and then in twenty twenty, that's when the Historical Vehicle Association calls me back and he says, "Hey." You know, you remember us? We were at the Chrysler Car now, uh, Chrysler Carlisle uh, Nationals, and I said, "Yeah, sure." And it says, well, "Yeah, we'd like to induct your car into the Library of Congress." And I was like, "What?" And that's the how Library of Congress. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. So the whole, so the whole story in in the car is documented, you know, and uh, and yeah, it's it's actually what's it called? The interior. I forgot what they call it, but it's the. Um, it's going to be um, in in with the or it's registered with the uh, Library of Congress for 500 years. Wow. For, for the story and the, you know, the car and everything. So, OK, that's very cool. That's pretty, I'll, uh, yeah. what I'll do is I'll Google that and I'll look up the link and I'll put yeah, a link look, into the uh, into the uh, YouTube channel there. So now somebody told me that this car was um, in a glass case or glass yes. dome or something that, like that. that where that was, was that? Part, that was part of that. So that was in Washington, D.C., in front of the Capitol. Wow. So, in, so they had the Capitol building there, and then they had the, the on the National Mall. So they had the car encased in glass for 10 days for that induction. And now the, in, is, it was used to be called the uh, Historical Vehicle Association. But now um, Haggerty takes over that organization now, and now it's called the, the Haggerty Drivers Foundation. So if you go to uh, – I made a website for the car. So if you go to um, blackghost426.com, and when you go there, you'll see 
um, all the information to the Haggerty's Drivers Foundation there. You can get all your information right from there. Because okay. I want people to know, you know, about the car. And, sure. uh, you know, so they can understand what that means and what that award means. So as soon, you go to the, when, as soon as you go to the website, you, you'll see Welcome to the Journey. And then when you scroll down and you'll see the 2020 uh, inductee. And then you click that to find out more button. And it'll take you to uh, Haggerty's Drivers Foundation's page. Let's get to how it ended up at Meekum and what's your plans with it from, I, I guess, this point on. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, so the the, the Meekum thing all happened. Um, so before that happened, um, Dodge, um, after the, the Historical Vehicle Association happened, mm -hmm. Dodge made a tribute car. It's okay. a modern uh, Hellcat Red Eye. 807 horsepower with a 309 uh rear axle and so they made it the could they make they're only making 300 cars for the united states they're made after my dad's car so okay. it's all black white bumblebee stripe they did a gator grain roof uh you know vinyl pattern uh um, right top, basically and they also put the dodge face on the front and then the challenger logos on the side of the car very cool. Instead and of only, the Hellcat logos, and only three hundred are made. Up. Yeah, three hundred are made. Yes, you can um, you can look that up. And just type in the Black Ghost uh, tribute car. Okay. Come up. Um, those are like like about ninety nine thousand, something like the hundred thousand, ninety nine thousand. Three hundred cars only. I mean, you know, all the dealerships going to grab them up. Yeah, right? pretty much. Pretty yeah. much. That's okay. yeah. You know, they'll be out there, right? It's okay. So, yeah, yeah during 2014, be, you know, before my dad, uh, I think he was having the, he was sick then, I believe, because um, he called me and says, hey, so I want you to come to the house and have a beer with me. So I went to the house and then uh, it went into his room and stuff. And he was, he was end up, he was watching Meekum auctions at the time. And he was looking at the TV and then he was like, oh man, I wonder what, what I can get from my car going across the block. Cause that was one of his things that he always wanted to do. And, um, and I said, yeah, I don't know, dad. I mean, you know, you, you just sell the car, you know, if you, you need the money, sell the car. And he says, and he's like, ah, you know, I'm not sure I have to, you know, fix up the car and get it running. And is it car needs a lot of work and I probably wouldn't get that much for it. So then he says, Leah, let's go out into the garage. So then we go out into the garage and then, um, <clears throat> we start taking the covers off the blankets off the car. And I think mm -hmm. this is where he's kind of hinting to me that he was sick and then he wanted to get the car running. Oh, okay. So then we, we take the, the covers, the horse blankets off to the car and all the stuff off the car. It was real dirty and dusty. So we kind of cleaned it off and everything. And I was like, yeah, it's cool. This is a cool looking car, dad. And then that's when I realized as an adult seeing the car, mm -hmm. I was like, wow, this thing has to be kind of special in a way because of the way it looked, it was very unique looking to me. Right. And, um, yeah, I didn't know really too much about it. And then, and then after that, that was it. And I, we didn't do anything, anything more after that. But I think it was hinting to me because I think that's when his sickness came back, that he only had so much time left. And I wish he had told me and maybe it could have been things could have been different. Um, so then go forward. So um, so after the tribute car comes out from the Dodge, the Dodge made. Then it came, I came to the realization, it's like, you know what? We can't really drive the car anymore because all the insurance rates kept going up. At this time, I had my insurance uh, company uh, reach out to me and says, you know what? We, we have to reappraise, reassess your car now because at this time, the car was already appraised at 500000 And then uh, I had to get, they reappraised the car for a million dollars. Wow. And at that point, I was like, oh, damn, we can't really enjoy this car anymore we can't drive it i can't really you know do the things that that we were kind of doing even at the five hundred thousand, it was kind of like risky you know like right. because we would trailer it everywhere and then at when it got to that point then that's when i realized i was like yeah it's it's we're really going to be sitting in a trailer or going to a big show right I mean, and it's not mm -hmm. many big shows so maybe right. once or twice a year and then that's it mm -hmm. so then um it just came to the point is I had to look back at what, what will my dad do in this situation? Okay. You know, knowing that the car is worth what it is. Right. And I had to look back at it and my dad would want us, you know, to help the family out. Cause that's the kind of guy he was, you know, he right. give, give you sure off his back if you needed it. And I knew that that was, 
you know, something that if I had to sell a car that he would be okay with it because he said, don't give my car away. He just wanted me to understand the value of the car and understand what the car is worth. So I just just sell it off for like a cheap amount and just get rid of the thing. And, um, and, you know, I believe that he would want us to be better off. And and then, so I came together with the family and we just made that decision that it's time just it's time for it to let it go because this could mm-hmm. be some life changing money to help the family out. You betcha, yeah, you betcha, man. So now yeah. it's appraised for a million, and it's at Meekum. And now, when does it go across the block? Isn't it in May in in the Indianapolis? Yeah, coming? yeah May May nineteenth in Indianapolis. And I would uh, presume that you and your family will be there. Yes, hooting and hollering. Woo! <laughs> are, you, are you gonna are you gonna be on stage with the car as it goes across yeah we'll, we will okay. be on stage with the car i think i think for us it's gonna be kind of like uh, a bittersweet moment right. because it's not like it's not it's gonna be kind of sad too you know and not just happy and you know i still have kind of mixed emotions of it you know is this the right thing that i'm doing is it and then i have to re- reaffirm myself yeah it is and you know it's just it's just one of those things that like, dang, you know, I kind of wish that the, the fame didn't get so high and then, you know, maybe it would, wouldn't have been as worth as much and I would have kept the car forever type of right. thing, you know. Right. But no, then, I'm you know, you, you come to some realization sometimes and, and it's, it's it's like a double-edged sword, you know what I mean? You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's my dad's car and it's like, you know, but at the same time, it can really help the family and, you know. Sure. So, like you said, yeah. it's life changing money you can get from the from the sale of this car, which is really yeah, cool. that's awesome. Yeah. I'm so happy for you regarding that. And you know, the nice thing about it is that with the media today, it's all digital, so it's going to be there forever. So you're yeah. not going to have any um, significant loss of the history of the car or anything like that. I mean, it's easy for me to say because it's not my father, and you know, I didn't lose my father, but at the same time, you have that permanence with uh, the digital media because once it's up, it's always up. Yeah. It's always going to be able to be cert- re- researched and whatnot. So, well, uh, Gregory, you know what, man? You have provided me a lot of great information, great story. You're an awesome guy. I'm really uh, excited to report this in an accurate manner. And uh, we are going to be doing our due diligence, like I said, to make it. It may not be Steven Spielberg worthy. <laughs> but we're still going to do the, our, our, our best job to properly represent this car. And I had to thank uh, right. my buddy David Morton over at Meekum, who actually allowed me full access to this car before the auction actually started one day. And I had access to the inside, the outside, took a lot of photographs, a lot of video. Good. And then I was able to, again, to uh, interview um, uh, John Cram- Cameron, Cam- Craman, isn't it? Craman, yeah. yeah Craman, Cram- yeah. John yeah. Craman with yeah. Meekum. And now I have a chance to interview you and whatnot. So thank you so very, very much. I appreciate your time today. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks for watching the last video. I hand selected a couple videos for you to watch right now. Click here.